Hello, I'm Doug Musio. This is City Talk. New York City in 2030, sustainable city or apocalypse New York? Sustainable City answers my guest, Dan Doktoroff, Deputy Mayor for Economic Development and Rebuilding. He's the architect, engineer, overseer, and chief cheerleader for Michael Bloomberg's multiple quote-unquote sustainability initiatives. Welcome back, Mr. Deputy Mayor. Thank you very much, Doug. It's always great to be here. Oh, it, it's a pleasure. Before we get into serious matters, I want to know <laughs> how many dictionaries and thesauruses you guys went and gals went through to have every word end in end so you could put YC so your videos are open NYC, maintain YC, green YC. And don't Come forget on. opinion YC, vision YC, uh, and the whole thing is called plan YC. YC. I right. mean, come on. No, thousands. <laughs> it's, it's a difficult thing. That was said, far more important than any individual sustainability initiative. It Trust me, it's getting, all about the marketing. Thank you. Sure. And, 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 and again, before we get into the substance, the marketing, your website is fabulous. And we'll talk about the website in a little bit. Thank you. Going through all of these reports and conversations, it reminds me of the old good news, bad news jokes. The good news is New York City's growing, and the bad news is New York City's growing. I, I think that's accurate, but I think that doesn't take it far enough. Go. The good news is, is that it was within our power, I believe, to have, if not at all, pretty close to it all, that if we take action today, on some of the key issues that we face over the long term. We can have smart growth, good growth, that can generate billions of dollars of revenues, and we can improve our quality of life. We can have a city that is cleaner, healthier, more reliable, and one that is better to live in for our children and grandchildren than the one we live in today. And this will be demonstrable and measurable. It has to be. You know, I'm, I'm a big believer that if you can't track it, you can't improve it. Mm -hmm. And so everything that we do, we are going to track. And that's why we first articulated a series of very clear, trackable goals. Mm -hmm. Now what we're in the process of doing is coming up with the very specific policies, procedures, regulation, legislation, financing mechanisms to actually be able to achieve those goals. And we'll talk about that. But if we don't do that, then maybe the post headline is right. I, I maybe we have, <laughs> I, mean, I know it's a little bit hyperbolic, but Apocalypse New York, we're growing right the into New York hell. Post, hyperbolic. Oh, no, it never no, happened. No, no, no. But <laughs> if in fact this city administration and subsequent city administrations don't take sustained efforts and, and extensive efforts, Another million people without the extra 500,000 housing units is the, a disaster. And, and what will happen is this will be an increasingly unattractive place to live. And you know, cities like people, organizations, they go in one of two directions. They go up or they go down. Nobody ever stays the same. You cannot tread water. And so I suspect what will happen is we'll continue some nice growth and then things will begin to become intolerable and things will begin to get worse. But the good news is we believe we have the power to change it today and do what we need to do. Okay, talk about each of the, talk about the major goals. There were 10 goals that the mayor in his uh, December 12th street, uh, speech at the Queens Museum articulated and he characterized them as aggressive types of goals that you were going to seek this in an aggressive way and talk about those 10 goals both 
individually, if you wish, and in terms of the, the, the larger Well, let, let, me, let me first step back and Go. say I think there are three critical challenges that the city faces. The first one is we are growing. Mm -hmm. The second one is our infrastructure is aging. Right. And the third is we are facing an increasingly precarious environment. With respect to growth, we believe that our population is going to grow from 8.2 million today to 9.1 million by 2030. Now that's the equivalent of cramming into our five boroughs a city the size of Boston and Miami Unbelievable. combined. Unbelievable. And, and that data comes out of this truly excellent report out of the Department of City Planning on uh, New York 2030. And if I might say, we talked about this off camera, produced by that population unit headed by Joe Salvo, who was one of the civic treasures in New he, York. He, he really is. That unit is. In fact, the Department of City Planning is. But we've even taken it further. Um, we have broken the city down into 188 different neighborhoods. We have projections based on housing demand and development that we foresee variety of other demographic factors for each one of those. So sophisticated uh, statistical modeling here. They're very sophisticated. And there's some very interesting things that come out of it. For example, your assumption would be that when you need, you know, when you have an additional million people, you're going to need a lot more schools. In fact, you don't need that many more schools. That was striking. Because the school age population isn't going to be increasing. On the other hand, we're going to have a lot more senior citizens in our city, and we have to have the ability to deal with those situations. So in any event, the population is going to be growing. What are the consequences of that? Housing. Already everybody feels the pinch Absolutely. today. We just did a survey uh, a few months back and asked people who left the city within the last two years why they left. By far the single most important factor, 64% said it was a major factor, was the cost of housing. I left longer than two years ago, and I can't get back because of the cost of housing. We want you back. I we, want We back. want somebody Let's to make like a you deal. back. Right. What do we, how do we do that? How do, you, how, do, right. how do we produce an additional 265,000 units of housing, and at the same time, goal number one, make it more affordable for New Yorkers? That's what we're working on. How out. do you pull that rab th those rabbits out of the that hat? We have to dramatically increase the supply of potential housing units. For too long, there's been too tight a relationship between supply and demand. And as a result, the price of land just keeps going up and up and up. And that is the single largest individual factor in the cost of housing. We have to break that. And that's why we've been rezoning parts of the city like crazy over the last five years. But there's a lot more we can do, and we're going to have to be much more and, and And that rezoning is both upzoning, downzoning. I mean, the, the land but, oh, and its uses is a chief source of conflict in the city as well. Land, in fact, is our biggest issue in the city. Absolutely. We don't have enough of it. Absolutely. And so we have to be much smarter about the way we use land. When the population grows by a million people, our already crowded mass transit system just becomes more crowded. Today, if you study it, 11 out of the 26 subway lines are seriously congested. Based on our pro projections by 2030, that'll be 23 out of 26. So how is it, goal number two, how is it that we can accommodate all these millions of additional residents, workers, because by the way, we're anticipating an extra 750,000 workers in the city, plus visitors. We just last month hit an all-time right. high in terms of the number of and visitors. Suburbanites and suburbanites. Who are coming, in, who are coming right. in. How do we accommodate them? And so we are going to have to be much more careful about the way we use our roads, our rail system, and our subways. Okay, let me just interrupt for a second. I hate up to bring up the important notion of money, but how do you pay for this? I mean, housing, there is no federal, the, the federal pipeline is dried up. There's no state money. We've almost got to do it ourselves. Transportation money, we need that Second Avenue subway. I they came down on the 6th, right. and you know the east side. If that line goes down, you're finished. So there are all these tremendous needs, but the infrastructure costs are 
gargantuan. They, they are, but we think they're manageable. Okay. And when we come back, okay. I don't want to give uh, away the store. We'll give for, away. you got a couple uh, of items in the no, store. No, I won't give away it. Except to say it will involve creative financing. Let me give you an example. You know, Robert Moses, there's a big exhibition at the City mm -hmm. of New York that's going to be opening, I think, February 1st. If you actually go back and study Robert Moses, you find that his true genius was in finding new sources of money that enabled him to rise above the ordinary sort of partisan and parochial bickering over funds. But it came from the feds. Well, some of it came from the feds. Some of it came from the Triborough Bridge and Tunnel Authority, right. which became his right. own private so source of funding. So we're going to have some funding. creative finance that you'll already, be attacked we, we, for, obviously. Of course, but we've already done that. I'll give you an example, the number seven line. Okay, we are starting construction right. in the next mm -hmm. couple months on the number seven line extension over to the Hudson Yards area on the far west right. side. That is a project that will have gone from conception to construction within five years. Mm -hmm. No subway project in the last 50 years has been done as quickly. Why is it? We found a brand new source of funding. The city said, you know what, we're going to fund that. We're going to take responsibility. We don't want to compete with all these other transportation projects, but we kind of came up with a novel way of doing it. And that is, we went out to the bond market and we said, trust us, basically. There's going to be development around this subway line. We will repay you out of the proceeds of the development, the tax revenues around the number seven line. They not only bought it, the bond market, and I think it was a wise investment, we're only paying them 4.67%. It conflicts with no other priority for the MTA or for the city. We found a new source. We're going to have to be creative in doing that. Okay, I, I, without getting into detail, because I'm not obviously a ta tax policy <laughs> expert, but again those are estimates on potential development on that west side so i mean it depends on your models and the data that and the assumptions and data that goes into but those the concept models. that we're talking about is the same it, when you have okay. when you have millions more people residents visitors workers that generates billions and billions of additional revenues that's why we say growth if it's smart can be good but we have to recognize that in order to get those billions, you have to invest today. But we believe that it is a smart, good investment in our future that will pay off over and over and over again. Does that full west side become a third business district? What does it look like? In, 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 in the, in, in the post-Jet Stadium world, if you will. Well, I, don't want, I don't want to bring up, no. you know, <laughs> go ahead, I'm, I'm, sorry. Over. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm um, sorry. You know, in fact, the Jet Stadium was one part of a much larger plan. Talk about, all of which talk about what's there. Well, the Javits Center expansion is going ahead, the number seven subway. We're investing hundreds of millions of dollars to create open space, parks, Mm -hmm. connections. And it's going to uh, generate enough money to pay for the number seven, you, you figure. Well, in fact, the public sector will invest about four or five billion dollars in the seven line and the other infrastructure. Over the course of 25 years, we think we'll get in tax revenue, new tax revenue, 60 billion dollars mm. back. Hopefully. We, we feel very confident that's going to be, there's all sorts of activity. I hope underway. so, too. I, I tend to be around. We rezone the area for 30 million square, 35, 40 million square feet of space. So, and that's that development that pays mm -hmm. for it. So the, the point is, is that growth can pay for these things we know we need to do to sustain the growth. There's this virtuous cycle that's created. That's in many ways the underlying I like philosophy. like virtuous cycle. Very yeah. nice, nice turn of phrase. Talk about the housing. Well, housing, again, I think the key thing for us is to create where, as much potential. Where do you build it? All over the city. Where? I mean, well, are there... Let me I'll give you a classic example of things that are a little farther out. The, Bron the South Bronx. I think the South Bronx is going to be one of the hot mm. areas for development. We all easy know... Easy access into Manhattan. Easy access into Manhattan, easy access out to Westchester. Yep. 
um, easy access, in fact, out to the entire metropolitan sure. area. Sure. You're seeing significant development for the first time in decades. Mm -hmm. We have literally billions of dollars of private investment going into the South Bronx. There is enormous potential for additional housing in the South Bronx. And go ahead. And no, as you ahead. and you and I have talked about, the Rockaways are clearly a prime ocean front. I mean, and the housing's booming again. Though the sort of the the intertwining of these various elements, you got to get to work. So you you can't you you got to use ferries or something. You well, got to get people off the peninsula to Manhattan. And ferries may be a key part of it. For every single one of these major developments, transportation is the key. Mm -hmm. If you think about, you can't just plop housing down any place. It has to be housing that has great mass transit, and that can be a combination of upgraded subways. It can be ferries. It can be we're now piloting bus rapid transit in five routes throughout the city, and I hope to expand that fairly significantly so you get the benefit of the subway mm -hmm. without having to invest in the infrastructure. Mm -hmm. Same thing for ferries. So every single place has got to have mass transit. The other thing it has to have is it's got to have open space. You have to create communities where people really want to live. And we've done an inventory of open space in this city, and we're projecting that by 2030, 2.7 million people will live more than 10 minutes from a park. And in a city where obesity rates are 10% greater than the national average among children, that's not acceptable. So what you'll see as part of this plan is a major change in both policy and increase in investment mm -hmm. to substantially increase neighborhood open space. And, and, and that open space for Parkland could come from brownfields. I mean, well, you're converting uh, fresh kills into the largest park and the highest point in the United, right United right States. Right now in New York City, this, this is one of my favorite statistics, we have projects underway to rehabilitate largely for parkland 68 miles of waterfront wow. in the city. Wow. We're in the single biggest boom in terms of the development of parkland since Robert Moses in the 1930s. Yeah, and, 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 and again, folks sort of focusing on the ocean as a Queens kid swimming in the Rockaways, it just seems that this is a potential. Okay, let's talk about some of the, the less sexy items okay. on, on, on your agenda. Water systems and power grids. Well, by 2030... Particularly, let's talk Con Ed. <laughs> okay. By, by 2030, almost every single one of our major infrastructure systems, whether that's our power grid, our water supply, or even our subway system, each one of those is going to be almost 100 years or well, more. Well, the sewer system's 1,000 years at, old at, now. At our current rate of investment in the sewer system, oh, we will not get to a state of good repair for 500 years. Oh, good. The very cheerful. <laughs> well, you know, we've, no, got, we've, got, we've got to face up to the facts right. today, right? If and we you guys are going to do this in 20 years. We didn't say we'll, be, we'll, we'll invest 500 years in 20, <laughs> but we will substantially increase it. We will provide redundancy. We'll complete the mm -hmm. third water tunnel, which will enable us to actually begin to inspect the first two water tunnels, right. which hasn't been done and, I think since and they've they were got to be 70, leaking. The Delaware, the Delaware Aqueduct, which is a critical source of water for the city, leaks 20 million gallons a day, and so there is no, there is no other option but to substantially increase investment in those critical infrastructure. Power, systems. power. There's two. two How do we do it? Uh, clearly. We're exceeding the capacity of the current system. We're not, we're not actually exceeding the capacity or at least of the, the generating No, I don't mean today. that. I mean the distribution Con Con and everything is going to have to invest more money, um, and people are going to have to pay for that. Uh, but we think that can be done. A bigger issue we face is over the next five years, uh, demand for energy will exceed our supply. There are only two ways to deal with that. One is to increase supply, and we have to have additional capacity in the city or dedicated to the city. What and where? Well, that's part of what we're going to come out with. We think there are opportunities. Well, let's talk about the what. Let, let, the let, let, let me give you an example, though. Already. You've got a lot of old power plants, old power plants, 
use more than 50% more fossil fuels sure. than new ones do. New ones can be much smaller. You can repower plants Money. on existing. Money. How do you pay yeah, for it? Well, again, I think you'll see we come up with fairly novel okay. solutions okay. when okay. we come back, uh, come back in March. The other thing we can do is reduce demand. Right. Okay. We have done a terrible job as a city. We've done a terrible job um, as a country in reducing demand for energy, for fossil fuels, obviously, that has broader fo mm -hmm. foreign policy mm -hmm. implications. It also has environmental implications. And uh, we will come back with a series of policies and incentives to significantly reduce demand as well. One thing that the mayor didn't mention here, and that is in his speech, and I haven't seen mentioned too often, is garbage. Uh, you know, the solid waste management plan. No, that was in, that was, that was in the speech. Goes somewhat toward alleviating the, the crisis, but we're producing a lot of garbage, and it's costing a lot of money. Is there any consideration sort of merging the power and the garbage to go to Miss Byrne at some point? Well, I mean, the, is that part of the... That, I don't that, want to that, get you in trouble. No, no, that's not part of the plan. Um, people who know a lot more about this than I do will tell you that in Europe, for example, there is new incineration technology. But I want to make clear, okay. we're not All suggesting right. no, that. No, no, I just... But what happens in the future, well, well beyond us, we'll have to see how technology evolves. But... Oh. For now, that is not a part of the plan. Okay. You said looking into the future. How many days are on that countdown clock in the right. bullpen? Well, as of today, there are 1,065 days until the end of the Bloomberg administration. So you've got not much time. I mean... No, there's not a lot of time. And, that's and this why is a huge effort. I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, no. It, it's, a, it's an enormous effort, and that's why... We expect to come back with the specific solutions by March, and our goal is to have as much of it cemented in place by the time the mayor leaves office at the end of 2009. Because clearly different mayors have different agendas in different times. I mean, there, 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 there is that element. Just talk briefly about, I know you don't want to, you know, give us any, you know, previews to this. The Plan NYC, what do you expect to produce to disseminate to the public, announce to the public at the end of March. At the end, at the end of March, right around the end of March, uh, we will produce very, very specific policies, regulations, legislation, financing mechanisms to meet each one of the ten goals that the mayor laid out in his speech in March. So whether wow. so whether it is having every New Yorker live within ten minutes of a park or providing backup systems for our uh, water system, or whether it is improving travel times while accommodating millions more workers, uh, visitors, and residents, we will come back with very specific, measurable uh, plans in order to achieve. And this effort is going to be centered in this office of long reign, long term planning and sustainability that's in the mayor's office of operations. That's correct. And so you've got you've got hundreds, if not thousands of city workers working on this. I mean, is that I, I, I would I, think that you would almost have to it, it, for the last year and a half. There have been I mean, added them all up at hundreds of people from 15 different city agencies working on this. OK. Let's before let's go to your website because I want I want you to a answer. How does everybody get to know what we've been talking about and much more? And that's to go to the you know the nyc.gov. Yeah, uh, we, we have website. a ter we have a terrific website. It's www.nyc.gov/planyc. It's P L A N Y C. Twenty thirty. And uh, there you will see the goals laid out. Uh, there is a wonderful section for people to uh, write in suggestions mm -hmm. as to how we might meet each one of those goals. And thousands of people have been doing it. There have been some fabulous suggestions. There have right. been some wacky suggestions. Right. But we're looking at them all. And I personally look at the website all the time to see what people are saying. And a lot of the, a lot of the suggestions we are actually looking at doing research on. We're running by, in some cases, our sustainability advisory board, which we put together to advise us in this process, which consists of leaders from business, but also virtually every major environmental group. So we're 
we're serious, and we're also going to have a series of town halls and meetings. With and you've already begun oh, discussing yeah. with community we, leaders and, and, and com general community members. We've about met with this. over a hundred uh, organizations already, and that process is going to continue up to the end of March. Also, uh, the viewers should watch the videos. They are informative. They great production values. Excellent job. The whole website. My only. My only comment is that you have this opinion New York and you ask a question a day and you've got the history of the questions but you would if I may say so what you need is real resident surveying and I know Jeff K over at operations is considering citywide citizen satisfaction surveying which would get at this in a very detailed way absolutely okay some some quickies the lightning round Okay. Why is congestion, price, uh, congestion pricing so popular, and why are you guys hesitating? Oh, I, 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 first of all, I'm not sure it's so popular. Okay. Uh, public opinion surveys, depending on how the questions asked, people are split okay. roughly 50-50. Okay. Um, look, um, there is one reason why, pe why people are opposed to it, and it's that they actually have to pay money to drive into Manhattan or drive in within Manhattan. On the other hand, we all recognize that this is an idea uh, that uh, has merits in terms of reducing congestion, in terms of raising revenue, but it also, I don't think, would ever fly unless the people who are hurt, who don't have transit options, get much more access to mass transit. Okay. So it's got to be combined if you're going to do something like this with a significant additional investment in mass transit. Okay, 30 seconds. East River Bridge tolls. I don't think that's in the cards. Okay. Mayor 2009. This looks like an awful good agenda to run for mayor on. I'm, I hope um, everyone who runs for mayor in 2009, none of whom will be me, um, who runs on this agenda. This is critical to the future of the city, but I have no political aspirations whatsoever. And. I, it seems to me that this is the future of the city, and in some sense, this is the most important thing that, that the administration is doing. Well, you know, look, it would be very easy right now for the mayor who's sitting on top of fabulous approval ratings, 75 to 16 oh, percent, I know. to basically be complacent and say, look, times are great. They're going to be good, hopefully, at least through the end of this year. We can, can Our crystal ball gets a little murky after that and say, you know what, not my problem, somebody else's problem. I think everyone in the city now appreciates that's not the mayor's way. The mayor calls him like he sees him, and he views his really sacred obligation as to leave to our children and grandchildren a city that is cleaner, healthier, more reliable than the one we enjoy today, despite the fact that we're going to have all these additional people coming into it. And we take that obligation really seriously, and we're acting on it. Good luck. I hope you succeed. <laughs> You're going to come back and then explain the plan NYC that you didn't want to talk about today? Absolutely. Okay. Thank you.